Mr. Hundal, the Labour Party leader Ed Miliband, suggests his foreign policy will make a difference in the Middle East, but he did differ from new Labour and Tony Blair. Tell us more, uh, how would you see the difference? Well, some of that has been touched upon by your other guests, but I think the difference is quite significant if you go into the details. Ed Miliband does not like war, he does not like confrontation, he much prefers debate, negotiation and diplomacy. But there are obviously other people within the Labour Party who take a much hawkish view and he's had to bring them over and keep them on side while also keeping the non-interventionists in the Labour Party on side. It's been a tricky balancing act for the Labour leader because his main aim within the party has been to keep it together without letting the party collapse into massive civil war. So, I mean, you know, the, 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 the intervention in uh, Libya is an example where he criticised the Prime Minister for not doing uh, better to protect the people of Libya after the intervention and also uh, stopped the intervention into Syria because uh, of worries that that wasn't properly thought out and it was going to make things worse. So he doesn't have, you know, unlike Tony Blair, he doesn't have a view which is we should always intervene or we should always do this, we should always do that. He's very much of the view that we have to take each situation as it comes we have to think carefully about whether it affects uh, people, whether it helps them or not, whether the situation will be improved or not. Mm. And, uh, and notably, he took a very different view from different Labour leaders in the past by uh, not only uh, saying that the Labour Party will recognise Palestine, but also criticised Israel quite strongly during its incursions into Gaza last, uh, so last time. So, you know, that he's taken a very different view from the Labour leadership in the past. Mm. But this has caused, as, as you just said, Mr. Hundal, a, a little bit of, uh, uh, you know, varied opinion within the Labour Party, which needs, like you said, uh, keeping together. But then again, there's someone here with his Labour Party, uh, including different and varied, maybe perhaps contrasting views, and then he's a hopeful to, to be the Prime Minister. Now, uh, Assuming he won the elections, how cohesive will the Labour Party stay over his policies? Because we do know very well, especially over the state of Palestine, many Labour MPs were not, uh, didn't really share the same views of Mr. Binnebent. Yeah, it's always a difficult balancing act because the Labour Party and, in fact, even the Conservative Party have are, are broad churches. You know, I went to a Islamic Relief Dinner where Alan Duncan MP, who was previously a minister within the Conservative government, said that he thought his party was wrong and it should have recognized Palestine. So the fact of the matter is both parties have different elements, uh, different people who will have different views and that's one of the great things about democracy. Mm. Uh, the Labour uh, leader, leader will have a uh, significant uh, challenge from people who think that they should not recognize Palestine or do more to recognize Palestine further uh, and should not criticize Israel. But I think we now have an opportunity to push him further on this issue like never before. Yes. And also make and, the argument mm, and be open and, to those arguments. Yes, and speaking of, of keeping the party together, do you think Mr. Miliband, uh, would you think he has the, uh, the, 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 uh, the leadership factor to keep the party together eventually? Yeah, I think people underestimate actually how strong he has been within the party in keeping things together. He's not only made a big change from the past in terms of foreign policy, but also in terms of political economy and saying that New Labour made a lot of mistakes in the way it regulated the banks and the way it dealt with the economy. It's also changed policy quite significantly in other areas too. Immigration is another example. Europe is another example. Yes. So. Oh, and he's all this time managed to hold together a party which has quite significantly different people with different views. Um, and I think people underestimate him because they think that he's a weak leader, but he's not. Within the party, he has managed to carry people together yes. and take them 
and, into a new direction. Yes, and speaking of uh, the EU, how would you assess Mr. Miliband's last week at Chatham House linking Mr. Cameron's government policy in Libya to the recent tragedy in the Mediterranean migrant boats, the, the migrants trying to come to the EU? I think he was absolutely right to, to say what he said. And despite the controversy, I think he should have gone further. I absolutely bl blame David Cameron. Further, for, further to where? Would, would you want to elaborate? I think, you know, he did not specifically criticize Cameron. He did not blame Cameron for the deaths in the Mediterranean. Did you want but him I, to? I would have wanted him to, yes. There's Mr. I think. Spring here saying the same thing. Tell us, Mr. Spring, why would you have wanted him to be so forwards when it comes well, to this, this accusation? Where, this, 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 is accusation yeah, this is where Miliband was padding his words a bit, pulling his punches. Um, the facts are that it was not the post-conflict planning that has led to these disasters in the Mediterranean. It is the conflict itself. Mm. And David Miliband, yes. David Miliband must take 100% responsibility for every person who has died in the Mediterranean because under, under Gaddafi... Why not any other leader from the EU? Because Cam Why is it Mr Cameron? Cameron created the war in, on Libya. He was the one who pushed with Sarkozy for the RAF to bomb Libya from a great height. Mm. So none of our chaps got killed. So mm. that's a good war from mm. the British point of view. The facts are, though, thousands of extremely brave Libyans died. And also, there was a lot of collateral damage. And then after that, the British went into Libya itself. The um, so-called freedom fighters, or whoever they were called, they were assisted by British and French special forces that went into Tripoli. Mm. They were even giving orders in English, go to the right, go to the left. And um, with the final uh, lynching of Gaddafi, the SAS was very much involved. Mm. And back uh, to you, um, uh, uh, Mr. Hundal, uh, you seem to be very critical of recent articles in the media. I must say there is some tension escalating in the language many media outlets of the right wing are using. How would you explain that on some occasion you even describe it as neo-Nazism? Well, I mean, I suppose you mean the articles by Katie Hopkins, which I described as using neo-Nazi language. Um, you know, I think that there is, um, it's worrying that we are seeing uh, an escalation in rhetoric in the UK and blaming people in, um, uh, in the Mediterranean for their own deaths and also calling them these names. I mean, Katie Hopkins is one. Uh, Frank, thankfully, she's been the only one who's gone that far. And I think that the significant backlash to her shows that most British people do not approve of such language. Um, so, you know, it's worrying, obviously, but I have faith in the British people, and I think that most of them would not use such language. And I think that when I saw and, and I've heard uh, even uh, news programs that she's been on and radio programs where she's been on, she's had a lot of criticism from people. Yes. And but, but then again, sorry to interrupt, uh, Mr. Humdal, you, you say that the, the Mr. Miliband should have gone further over the migrant boats, but you, don't you think it's a little bit desperate to use uh, those innocent souls who were trying to get into the EU as a weapon to mobilize voters when it comes to blaming the, Labour, the Conservative Party and Mr. Cameron particularly? How do you think about the timing and sort of almost abusing this politically to get into uh, uh, pe more people into the ballots voting Labour? Well, the, time, the timing point is a bit irrelevant because Mr Miliband had to make a big speech on foreign policy before the election. We had to know where he stood on foreign policy and what his vision was. Uh, and that was right to do so. I wish he'd done it earlier, but he had to do it sooner or later. Mm. On the, by the Mediterranean deaths, actually, I'm glad that he made that point because someone had to raise on a bigger level that these people were dying as a result of policy which was partly driven by Europe. And mm. we have to take responsibility for that. And Cameron had to take responsibility for his own actions. And I'm glad that he made that point. Otherwise, if he hadn't made that point, then lots of people would have criticized him for saying nothing over the Mediterranean deaths and not 
mm -hmm. taking in, uh, taking uh, Cameron to task for what he did. You just mentioned because of policies drafted by, by Europe. But then again, the Labour Party seems not to challenge Europe very much. Anyway, so Mr. Suni Hundal, author of India Dishonored, also runs Liberal Conspiracy, one of the UK's top three most influential left-of-centre politics blogs. Many thanks for your participation today.